praise be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We have been studying in 1 Samuel. And as you may notice, it's not back there behind me today. And that's because we're going to be going from 1 Samuel chapter 9 to 1 Samuel chapter 13. And so it means that uh, I'll be flipping through pretty fast. Uh, and, but I will tell you, if you have a paper and pencil and you want to write it down, if you have a Bible and you want to get there, uh, we can, you can do that. Uh, so in chapter, whoops, in chapter 8, we saw that Samuel being told by the people that they want a king, that they didn't want God to rule over them anymore. And they wanted a king so that it could be like all the other nations. And we talked about always wanting to be like everybody else. You know, whenever we want to be like everybody else, generally, it means that we're going to mess up. And so God, Samuel went to God and said, I don't want to do this, God. And God said, listen to them, just do what they want. Okay, but I want you to warn them that it's not going to turn out the way they expect. And so which brings us to chapter 9 of 1 Samuel. And it starts out and says, There was a man from the tribe of Benjamin whose name was Kish. And we find that this man Kish was very influential. First, the end of verse 1 says he was a powerful man. Which, it, it can mean a number of things. And I'm going to look here at the, at the actual Hebrew words. It can mean he was a good man. That he was a very masculine man. That he was, he was a man of, that was bountiful, had a lot of, had a lot of things that he was better than a lot of other people, that he was loving, that he was jolly, that he was pleasant, that he was prosperous. Uh, those things are things that describe this man, Kish. It says, and he was patient, he was big man, big, physically, a big man. And he had a son, and his son's name was Saul. And Saul was a handsome man, young man. He was, he was handsome, and, and no man in Israel was more handsome than Saul, it says. And, and he stood a head taller than everybody else in the nation. So now you, got, you have this scenario set down. We have, we have descriptions. There's this man, Kish, who apparently was very influential. He was powerful, probably a man of war. Okay? We can, if you can imagine, I you know a lot of times we, we think of biblical characters in, in the standards of today's living. And, and I want to remind people that back then, we would all look like wimps. Um, I, I have a, a sword in my office that, uh, similar to the ones that they use, not exactly because it's not as heavy as the ones they use. And I often think if I had to wield that sword for five minutes, my arm would feel like it's falling off. And yet these men went to war and they, and they stayed in battle all day long, swinging swords, carrying, carrying shields, wearing armor, throwing spears. They were mighty men. Things, men that were men's men, as we would say today. So this is the kind of person that Kish was, and he had a son named Saul, and Saul was very handsome and taller than anybody else in the kingdom. He was their movie, movie star. He was the kind of guy that, you know, the girl swooned over, uh, but he, uh, he was very modest as well, very shy, maybe because he got too much attention. I don't know. That's my opinion. That's not in the scriptures. The story goes on and says that Kish had three mules and the three mules ran off. And he sent his son Saul and the servant out to find the three mules. And they couldn't find them. And they ended up going to Samuel and they asked him, well, what you know, what should we do here? We can't find these mules. And so Samuel was told by God that the man that he had chosen to become the king was going to show up. So Saul and, Sam, and, Saul and, his, and his servant went to see Samuel. Some, and so as they were going, Samuel was coming toward them as they were going in towards the city. And the Lord had revealed that this was going to happen. 
So God said to Samuel, about this time tomorrow, I'm going to send you a man from the territory of Benjamin. I want you to anoint him as to be the king. So when Samuel saw, saw <laughs> there was a man, this is the, God said, this is a man I've told you about. So Samuel went to Saul and he says, first of all, I want you to know that the donkeys you were looking for are found. Don't worry about them. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to come along with me. We're going to go up to where the people are doing their sacrifices. I've already set a table for you. I've already put aside meat for you, which should have kind of caused Saul some, you know, ag agitation, I guess. Not, not in the negative sense, but kind of wondering what in the world is going on. Why would he be setting food aside for me? Because he didn't know what was going on yet. Saul, Samuel had not revealed to Saul what God's plan was. But see, God always has a plan. And we're going to get into that in a minute because God has a plan for you. So anyway, Saul went to have this sacrificial meal with Samuel. And as they were going down, uh, away, from the, away from the meal, Samuel said to Saul, send your servant on. I have uh, something I need to talk to you about, and I don't want him to be here. And so in chapter 10 of the book of 1 Samuel, we see Samuel taking a flask of oil, pouring it on Saul's head, kissing him and saying, The Lord has anointed you to be the ruler of his people Israel. You will rule his people and save them from their enemies. Now, this, I'm sure, came as a, a real shock. To Saul. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, Saul, Saul was out there politicking for that position. He wasn't even maybe aware of the fact that there was going to be a king in Israel. But Samuel went to him and said, okay, God says that I should anoint you to be the king and you're going to save your people. And then he starts prophesying. And I want us to see this because we have a lot of people who want to be prophets. You know, a lot of people want to be prophets. And, uh, and, and many people are just making guesses about things. This is the way a prophet speaks. When you leave me today, two men will be at Rachel's grave on the border of Benjamin. And they'll tell you that we found the donkeys you were looking for. And your father is no longer caring about them. He's caring about you. He says, keep on going until you come to the oak tree at Tabor. There you'll find three men on their way to worship God. One will be carrying three young goats, one will be carrying three loaves of bread, and one will be carrying a full wineskin. They will give you, or they will greet you and give you two loaves of bread. You accept that from them. After that, you're going to come to the hill of God where the Philistines have a military post. And when you arrive at the city, you will meet a group of prophets prophesying. And as they come... From the worst, as they come from the worship site, and they will be led by men playing a harp, a tambourine, a flute, and a lyre. And then the Lord's Spirit will come over you, and you will be a different person while you prophesy with them. And when these signs happen to you, do what you must, because God is with you. So Saul left Samuel at that point and went headed down the road. And it says, when Saul turned around, God changed Saul's attitude. Now, up until this point, Saul was of the kind of person who says, look, I'm, I'm a Benjamite. Our, our tribe is the smallest. And, and, you know, my family is not really important in, in that tribe. And, and I'm just a kid. You know, I'm just a young man. I haven't established myself in any way. What am I? I'm nothing. But Samuel said, no, God, God has established you to be the king. And here's some signs that you should go by. And he's very specific about what God is going to do. It wasn't, it wasn't vague things. You know, it wasn't like, well, you're going to go down the road here and maybe you'll meet some guys. And, you know, they'll talk to you about some things and, you know, and then you're going to go and, you know, somebody will offer you something. And it, it was very specific. God, when he directs us, he directs us not with vagueness. He directs us in specifics. As Saul was, 
hearing what's, what Samuel said, verse 7 said, God is with you. Some of you, in fact, all of you, have been set apart by God for a specific purpose in your life. And like Saul, many of us come with the attitude that, no, that can't be me. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not able. I, I, I'm nothing. I, I can't do that. I, I, God, I, I, I think you maybe have made a mistake here and, and, and you probably meant to call the, that guy over there, not me. Because I don't feel equipped to handle this call that you've placed in my life. I don't feel like I can... I, I have the right personality. I don't feel like I have the right education. I don't feel like... I, I, I just don't have that ability that this is going to take. But God is going to be with you in verse 7. And as Saul went down the road, it says God changed Saul's attitude. God changed Saul's attitude. And down all the signs that Samuel told him was going to happen, happened to Saul. Exactly the way Samuel said it was going to be. In verse 17, Samuel says to the people, Samuel called the people to come unto him in the presence of the Lord at Mizpah. Remember, Samuel is the prophet there, and the people come there to worship. And he said to the Israelites, This is what the Lord God of Israel says. I brought Israel out of Egypt and rescued you from the power of the Egyptians and all the kings who were oppressing you. But now you have rejected your God, who saves you from all of your troubles and distresses. You said, No, place a king over us. Now then, stand by your tribes and families, when Samuel had all the tribes of Israel come forward, the tribe of Benjamin was chosen. And when God had the tribe of Benjamin come forward, uh, when he had the tribe of Benjamin come forward, the families of Matri uh, was chosen. And then Saul, the son of Kish, was chosen. But when they looked for him, he wasn't there. Where was he? Now, you got to remember, Samuel had already anointed Saul to be king back in Mizpah. And here, they came to announce to the nation, Saul is going to be your king. And when they're looking for him, they can't find him. They said, Where's, where is he? Where is Saul? They said, well, he's hidden. He went and he hid himself. They couldn't find him. And when they asked of the Lord, the Lord said, well, he's hiding amongst the baggage. <laughs> Gives kind of an, an, an interesting uh, view of Saul. The young man Saul. Because when we all think of King Saul, very often we think of King Saul in his older years. Not in his younger years. King Saul started out as a humble, handsome, tall, strong individual that God had chosen. Because God was saying to the people at this point, He was saying, you wanted a king? Okay, I'm going to give you one like the one you asked for. I'm going to give you, you know, the, the movie star. I'm going to give you the guy, the great athlete, you know, the, the guy who stands out in the crowd, the one that everybody likes. I'm, that's who I'm going to give you as king. Paul, uh, Samuel says to the people, do you see who the Lord has chosen? Oh, there's no one like him. Saying it kind of sarcastically to the people. No, there's no one like him among all the people. And all the people said, Yeah, long live the king. And then Samuel explains to the people all the laws of what the king is going to do. Well, you know, the king's going to tax you, he's going to draft you into the military, he's going to take your servants, he's going to take your land, he's going to take your crops, he's going to do all these things because he has that ability to do so because he is king. And then there is always those kind of people that are always the dissenters who are saying, <laughs> I, why you didn't ask us if, he, if we wanted him as king? Don't we have those kind of things in our life? Listen, God will call you to do a ministry. God will call you to, to serve him in a certain way. And many times we have that feeling we can't do it. 
And we kind of try to withdraw from it. I know I, for, for 14 years, I, I hid from ministry. And after a while, it came to the point where I could no longer hide because people, because of people. I still felt that inadequacy. I still feel the inadequacy. But I felt really inadequate. Felt really like I can't do this. And it was kind of pushed into it. And maybe you are like that. Maybe you feel like I can't do this thing that God is asking me to do. You feel it in your spirit that God is calling you. You feel in your spirit that God is wanting, He has a plan for your life, but you can't do it. And so you kind of hide from it. The thing is this you can never hide from God. No matter where you are, you cannot hide from God. The psalmist writes, if I go into the deepest hell, you're there. If I go to the bottom of the ocean and the ocean caves, you're there. If I were to fly to the moon, you'd be there. I can't, we cannot hide from God. When He has a plan for your life, He is not going to take His hand off of you. It says the anointing of the Lord is without repentance. When God called you as a Christian, and he put a call on your life. He had a purpose for it. He knows you better than you know you, and he knows what he can do through you, and you haven't got the slightest idea what he can do through you. Many people start out their ministry that way. We start out feeling that we can't do what God called us to do. But God does the work in us, just like He did with Saul. When Saul met the prophets, or when Saul walked away from Samuel, it says that God began to change him. And when Saul met the prophets, the Holy Spirit came upon him, and he began to prophesy the way that the other prophets were. And the people who heard him prophesying said, isn't this the son of Kish? You know, we know him. Yeah, we know him. This is the son of Kish. Why is he among the prophets now? And, and somebody there with a little bit of common sense said, well, who are the fathers of these other prophets? I mean, if you're, you're judging Saul because we know him and we know his father here. Well, what about these other guys? If you knew them, you might say the same thing about them. Can, God can choose who God wants to choose. There was one person there who, who had a little bit of wisdom. Don't let the people around you give you negative thoughts about God's call on your life. There's always people out there who are going to say, well, yeah, well, we know you. We, see, we know you when you were young. We saw how you messed up. We, we saw that mistake you made yesterday. We, you know, we understand. You know, Look at you now. See, you're getting mad because I'm saying these things. See, you don't have that kind of personality that it takes to do this kind of work that God's called you to do. You know, we have, there's always somebody there that is the naysayer. And these people, that's the way they were around Saul. They were the naysayer. And people there were saying, we don't want this man to, to rule over us because we know we know his family. And there's nothing special about them. Remember about when Jesus, when Jesus was starting his ministry and somebody said, you know, there's, this is Jesus. Uh, he was raised in Nazareth. And somebody said, this, nothing good comes out of Nazareth. How could he be the Messiah? You know, even in his hometown, when he was, he was there ministering, and, and he couldn't do many miracles there, he said, except to heal a couple people. Because the people said, wait, we know this is, this is the carpenter's son and that's his brothers and sisters over there. I mean, who's, who does he think he is? So even, even our Lord had the same kind of problems that he had to overcome when he was starting a ministry, the people coming against him. In chapter 11, we see Saul's first adventure. The king of the Ammonites, Nahash, 
came against the Israelites, and he had been coming against these Israelites throughout the land, and, and his practice was whenever he overcame a, a town or a city or a little province, he would take and poke out the right eye of all of the men in that province. So it would hinder them if they wanted to go to battle. And he came for Jabed, Jabesh Gilead. And he said, I'm going to come into your town. I'm going to take over your town. He had his army with him. And when I come in, I'm going to cut, it, I'm going to cut the right eye out of every one of your men down there. He says, uh, if, you want to, if you want to try to fight against me, that's okay. I, he, had, he was pretty confident about what he wanted to do. He had been having, he'd been having all these uh, places where he already overcame them, conquered them. He said, they said, well, you know, give us a few days and see if we can rally something together. And, and if, if we fight you and, and we lose, you can do what you want to do. Uh, if, if we can't fight you, you can do what you want to do. But give us a couple days so we, can, so we can get some things together. Well, they sent some messengers out and people started hearing about what this man was doing. And it, the word got to Saul. He was out there, you know, working in the field. There's the king, right? The king is out there plowing the field. Still has this humble attitude. You, well, you were anointed king. You're going you're gonna to deliver your people. Yeah, well, yeah, I got to plant this corn. Sometimes when the call of the Lord is on your life and we kind of get back, we say, well, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll take care of it later. I'll, I'll do it later because right now I see these things that I have to be doing. You know, these, these are the things I've been doing for the last 30, 20 years. And, and I, I got to just, I'm not going to stop doing that now just because God wants something from me. And so we, we kind of side table God's call instead of saying, well, Lord, if, if you really want me to be this, you really want me to do this, okay, I'm going to start reading your word and studying and, and finding out what you have to say about that ministry, and then, Lord, lead me. Saul was this, still the same guy. He says, I can't do this. I'm just going to go keep on doing what I'm doing. But anyhow, when the word got to Saul, I and mean, all the people were crying and they were, they were upset because King Nahash was going to come in and take over these people of the, the Reubenites, the Gadites, and he's going to poke out their eyes. And Saul, it says, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Saul again. See, when the Spirit of the Lord moves upon you, when, when the Spirit of the Lord comes into your life and, and starts working in you, He starts changing the way that you think. You cannot continue to live in this world thinking the way the world thinks if you want God's Holy Spirit to work in your life. From the moment that you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, the Holy Spirit comes in and starts causing some changes in the way that you see the world and the way that you see your life. Right away, you just have this, this awareness that God's way of doing things is not the way you've been doing things. And that there's changes that need to be made. And so when Saul hears about what's going on up there in uh, 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 Jabesh Gilead, the Bible says he, uh, he became angry. It says the Spirit came upon and overcame him, and he became angry. How can people treat my people, my Israelites, like this? And he took a, Saul took a couple of his oxen, he cut them in pieces, mm -hmm. and he sent pieces out as, with messengers throughout all the land. And, and here's what he said. If you don't come and help your brothers... I'm going to come to your house and I'm going to kill your oxen. Now, the oxen were like, you know, the tractors of the day. They were the, they were the things that they used for transportation. They would, you know, ride on an oxen, pull a car with an oxen, do the plowing with an oxen. And in some cases, they ate the oxen. So it was, Saul was saying, if you don't come and give us a hand, I'm going to come over there and I'm going to kill your oxen and you'll have nothing. So all of these people came and helped him. And God showed him how to destroy the people of, of, of Nahash. And he did. He destroyed that whole, that whole army. It was his first trial. 
And he showed himself powerful. He showed himself as one who knew how to lead, as one who knew how to, how to set up an ambush and how to destroy the enemy. And so the people rallied behind him. The problem is, when we come into some victories, we get more comfortable with the work that God has called us to do. No, you're there and you're, I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do it. And then God puts a, a trial in front of you and you, you go, okay, Lord, I'm going to try, I'm going to do this because I, I feel like you're telling me I should. And, and it turns out right. And you go, oh, wow. That wasn't so bad. Yeah, I can do that. I, I can't tell you how many people I've heard say, you know, I can't get up and talk. I can't stand in front of people and talk. I just don't have that in me. I, I can't. I can't teach. I, I don't have enough understanding. I can't teach. I don't have enough faith to go out and, and pray on over the sick. I, I can't do that. But then they're put in a situation where it's either, you know, sink or swim. And they find out that not only can they do that, but they can do it victoriously. They can do it right. And then they start to feel comfortable with it. And so they start, they do it. I mean, it's like, okay, you know, I found out that I can speak in front of a crowd. I'm just going to start talking to people about the Lord. I found out that I could witness for Christ on a one-to-one -one basis. And it worked out. That, that guy, you know, they, he really shows interest in the Lord. And, and, oh, hey, this one over here, pray the sinner's prayer with me. And, 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 we, and you start to feel like, okay, I can do this. I can do it. Yeah, God, thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. I, you, you've given me the, the call. You've given me the ability. I thank you for that. And we go on with life thinking, oh, wow, this is really great. Now, we're going to skip over chapter 12 real quick because chapter 12 is all about Samuel telling the people of Israel that he's leaving and that God's not happy with him. We're going to go to chapter 13. Now, Saul's now 30 years old. He's probably been king for maybe 10 years. Eight years, I don't know. He became king, and when he became king, he stayed as a king for 42 years, it says. And he built up an army. He, uh, he started ruling like a king. He started taking things from the people, you know, taxing them and... and, and uh, uh, gathering men around him, gathering servants around him, gathering chariots and horses and all that around him. He was now king of Israel. He had been fighting against uh, enemies right and left, and, and he's winning some wars. You know, he has become comfortable with who we are. And other people around him started saying, yeah, king's really a good king. I mean, Saul's really a good king. He's really doing a great job. And then we start, you know, what happens to many people is, once you get comfortable with what God is doing in you, you start to feel a little bit arrogant. And, and, and we can, I can do this. You know, I, I don't have to have God t t tell me to do it all the time. I can just do this. If seeking God's will is not so important. It's, it's all about me getting out and doing the job. And there's a lot of us people in ministries who feel that way. You know, we, we start out in ministry thinking, I can't do this, Lord. I, there's nothing I can do without you. I, I, and then we remember that Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And we go, okay, Lord, I will I'll do it. I'll, I'll do it. But God, it's going to have to be you. It can't be me because I can't do this on my own. And then we find that things starting to flow a little bit better. We go, oh, wow, this isn't so bad. Yeah, I kind of like doing this, God. Whoa, thank you for giving me this call in my life. And then later on, we kind of go, well, you know, I, I got it down. I can do it. A lot of Christians feel that way. A lot of Christians come to the Lord we come as sinners in need of a Savior. We come as, we come as people who realize that we're not going to be able to please God any way except to be obedient to Him because being obedient to the Lord is what we call faith. 
Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. So we have this, this thing where, okay, I'm gonna, I just want to obey God. I just want to do what He wants me to do. And so we get up in the morning and we pray and we read our Bibles and we say, God, show me today what you want me to do. It, make me aware of all the uh, opportunities you put before me, Lord. Put your words in my mouth, Lord God. Make me aware of the fact that you are, that you are guiding me. And we, we go out into the world and we start seeing, we start seeing that God is really working. And then we get to this idea that, you know, I'm pretty good at this. I can, I can just go ahead and do it. And that's where King Saul found himself. King Saul found himself in the place where he was saying, all right, I'm a mighty king and I got an army and our army is good and we can do pretty much anything we like. And when that happens, we start making stupid decisions. We step out outside of faith. We call it faith, but it's not faith, it's presumption. We start stepping forward and saying, I'm just going to step out here in faith and, and do this and trust that God is going to bless it. And that's not the way faith works. See, faith works with God saying first, this is what I want you to do, and then you saying, okay, it is not us saying, God, this is what I'm going to do. Now, bless it. And God saying, okay. That's not faith. That is presumption. And, and King Saul, in chapter 13, became very presumptuous. And he starts thinking of himself more highly than he ought. And so he gets his armies together, and he goes out to, goes out to battle, and we see his son, Jonathan, now has gotten to be older and he's part of the army. He had to be over 20 because you couldn't be part of an army until you turned 20 in, under the, under the uh, Israeli law. And we see Jonathan in chapter 13 going out with his armor bearer and, and he's showing faith. He's, he's kind of going off on his own and working his way over to where the Philistines camp, because they were fighting against the Philistines at this time, the Philistines camp was, and he's, he says to his armor bearer, he says, you know, God doesn't need a big army to defeat the enemy. He could do it with just one person if, if he wanted to because he's God. And so let's go, let's kind of sneak up and hear what the Philistines have to say. They, they sneak up to where they can hear some of the Philistine people talking, and the Philistines are talking about, you know, how the Israelites have this, this God that just watches over them and, and, and he wins battles for them. And so Jonathan and his armor bearer decide that they're going to put a fleece out. Like Gideon did. He said, well, Lord, you know, give us a sign. And if, if they say certain things, that then we can go up and we know that you're going to give them into our hands. And if they say something else, we know that we should just stay away. And so they kind of make themselves known, and the Philistines tell, say, come on up here, which was the sign for them that God was going to get, deliver the enemy into their hands. So Jonathan and his armor bearer go up there, and they, they meet, greet the, the Philistine guards, and they kill 20 of them. And the Spirit of God moves upon the Philistine camp in such a way that it confused the entire army, and the army starts to run around like we, the proverbial chickens with their heads cut off. And they're killing each other. Well, King Saul, way back, you know, meanwhile, back at the ranch, King Saul down in the valley is, is seeing all this commotion up there. And he's saying, what's going on? And he takes a head count and realizes that his son Jonathan and his armor bearer are not there. And so Saul says, well, let's go rescue him. And they go up there, and when they find out, when they get there, they find out that the Philistines are just kind of destroying themselves. So Saul and, and, and his army come back down, and they, they enter into another battle with the Philistines, and they, and they get into trouble because here, you know, Saul's doing this on his own now. See, he's not, he's not seeking God's will. He didn't say, God, should I go up there against him? He's doing this thing on his own. 
I, after all, he's king and he's a good, he's a warrior and he's got an army. And, you know, look what his son did. So he's just doing things on his own. And Samuel says, no, I'm going to come down there and we'll make an offering to God. Actually, the priest said, don't, don't go into battle yet. Let's, let's see what Samuel has to say. And Samuel says, okay, well, I'll come down and I'll make an offering to God. Well, the Saul, or Samuel was, was kind of slow in getting there. And so Saul became impatient. And so Saul decided, well, I'll, you just bring me the animals and I'll make the burnt offering to God. Now, that was not one of the privileges of being king because making the offerings to God was simply something that the priests and sought Samuel, who was anointed by God for, as the prophet and the leader of, of Israel, that they were allowed to do, but not Saul. And so Saul, just in his impatience, you know, Samuel, you know, he's always dragging his feet, he'll be late to his own funeral kind of attitude. He'll just go ahead and do it anyway. And so he, in verse 9 of chapter 13, says, bring me the burnt offerings and I'll make the sacrifice. And after he had finished making the sacrifice, Samuel shows up. And Samuel said, well, what did you do? And so Saul goes, well, you know, the, the troops were getting kind of edgy, so I'll, I just uh, thought we'd make the sacrifice. That way you don't have to. It's, you know, it's already done. We'll, but we'll just go to battle. And Samuel gritted his teeth And he said to Saul, you did a foolish thing. You didn't follow the commandments of the Lord your God. If you had, the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel permanently. But because you are such an idiot, the Lord is searching for a man after his own heart. And the Lord has found one and he's appointed him to be the ruler of his people because you didn't follow the Lord's commands. And this is the beginning of a saga. You know, if we were watching this in some kind of a TV, you know, broadcast where it had, you know, episode one, two, three, four. You know, this begins a, a, a saga in Saul's life where his arrogance... His arrogance put him in a bad light with God. The anointing of God is removed. Because now Samuel says, no, the kingdom's not going to be yours. God's going to give it to somebody else. And it affects Samuel in such a way, I mean, it affects Saul in such a way that he starts to lose contact with reality. And as we study in 1 Samuel, we're going to see more and more and more of this. And as, you know, we, we know now that it hasn't been done yet, but we know that David, the shepherd, the sweet psalmist of the Lord, is going to be anointed to take Saul's place. But between this time and the time that David actually sits on the throne, there's a lot of things that are going to take place. And, and most of those things are going to show that Saul is now on his own and the Lord is not blessing him anymore. And when, when you refuse to be repentant, see, had Saul repented instead of just arrogantly saying to Samuel, he could have said to Samuel, you know, Samuel, I'm so sorry. I, I stepped beyond my, my bounds here. I, I was being stupid. Please forgive me. Please ask God to forgive me. I won't do this anymore. But he didn't. He blamed it on the troops. Oh, the troops wanted me to do it, so I did it. Kind of like Aaron did when he made the golden calf at the base of Mount Sinai. Had he repented of his sin, God may have gifted, continued with him as king of, of Israel. But he didn't. And I want to say this. Many of us start out just like, just like Saul did. We start out humbly. We start, start, out, start, start out realizing that we can't do this without God. And then God blesses us and anoints us. And we realize that, okay, with God's help, we can do it. 
And then we start thinking, well, you know, we can do this even if God is not right. You know, God's over there taking care of something else. I'll take care of this attitude. Only to find that God now is lifting His hand of anointing because we're not listening to Him anymore. Now, the, the answer here to that kind of a situation is repentance. When we, when we get our minds set on that I can, I can do this. I don't really need God showing me how. I know how to do it. I've done this a hundred times and I can do it. I don't have to go to Him and ask Him how to do it. We get that kind of thing. God will give us the opportunity to get our heads screwed on straight again. To get our attitudes back in line. And he tells us when any thought comes up against the knowledge of God that we should bring it under submission to Christ. That we should, we should allow Jesus to begin to work in us again and the Holy Spirit to bring conviction upon our souls. And John says then if we confess our sins before God, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The, the key here is that we repent of the wrongdoing. Saul did not repent. In fact, Saul did just the opposite. He kind of gritted his teeth, stomped the ground, and says, I'm going to do it my way. And we find as Saul was doing it his way, he actually turned to doing things that God had told him not to do. Because God had given Saul the instruction to have all the, the mediums and the necromancers, those are the people who talk with the, with the dead, and all these, to get them out of, this, out of the country, kill them and drive, and drive them out and don't let them ever be in nearby. I don't want anybody consulting anybody except me, God says. I want to be the one who directs this nation and not some other spirit that nobody knows what they're dealing with. And we find King Saul later on going to a medium disguised as someone other than the king and she it was revealed to her that he was and asking for the spirit of Samuel who had passed away to come and give him some advice about going to battle and when the spirit of Samuel came uh, came to him and, and said you know what you're dead man God has not only taken the kingdom from you he's taken your life because you're, you not only are not now listening to God, you are disobeying Him, you are re rebelling against His Word, and He can't use you in that position. He can't even let you stay in that position. So, you might as well just kind of, you know, make out your will because time is short for you. If we continue to rebel against God and His Word... If we're, if we're willing to recognize that, you know, I'm wrong, I made mistakes, i got to go back to God and get things made right again. I have to repent of my sins. I have, to, I have to get in right standing with God. And the only way I can do that is to admit the fact that I've been stupid, I've been rebellious, I've been sinful, and ask, seek God's forgiveness. At that point, God says He'll forgive and He'll cleanse unrighteousness. He may change the call in your life slightly. But remember, the call and the anointing of the Lord are without repentance. In other words, God's not going to say, all right, I can't use you anymore. If we are willing to repent of our sins. Now, we can turn away and not walk in God's call. And, uh, and that's, our, that's our choice. But God himself says, no, I'm not going to. If you repent, you come to me and you try to get it right, we'll get it right. This whole story of, of King Saul started out just like many of us start out as Christians. Hopefully, we will end the way he ended. King Saul went nuts. He went crazy. An evil spirit started taking over his mind. He started thinking things that weren't true. He started, he started killing or trying to kill the anointed of God. He, he, was, he was just completely insane. And all, you know, all would have taken was way back years before if he had just said to Samuel, Samuel, I'm sorry. I messed up. 
I, I want you to seek the Lord for me and have him forgive me. Because, and I, and I will do my best not to do this ever again. But he didn't. And this is a lesson for each one of us. As we read the scriptures, as we study the history of Israel, it's a lesson for us. And it's not only a lesson for us as Christians, it's a lesson for us as an American. Because we in America started out that way. We started out with God's anointing upon this land. The pilgrims, the, the Puritans, the people that came here originally came here with the understanding that God was bringing them here to a new land to settle in where they weren't going to be oppressed by their government. They could worship the Lord how they pleased without that kind of an oppression. And they wanted to share the gospel with the, the people that were here. Now, they didn't do everything right. I'm not going to say that they did. They, they made a lot of mistakes. But their motive was right. And over the years, we became a great nation, just like King Saul. We won, some, we won some wars. We became strong. The rest of the world started accepting the United States of America as one of the great powers of the world. Just like the people in Israel started accepting Saul as their leader. And then we became arrogant. And we started thinking that, you know, we ought to be able to police the whole world. We ought to be able to make every nation out there become just like us. And I want to remind you all that since World War II, we have not yet won one war. We have won battles, but we have not won a war since World War II. We've been fighting battles for, for decades in some countries. We haven't won. If we had won, we wouldn't be fighting the battles. If we had won, the countries that we were fighting for would be free, but they're not. We haven't won a war since World War II. Why? Because we thumped our chests and said, we are America and nobody can defeat us. We can make it. And we pushed God out of schools. We, took, we tried to take the Ten Commandments off our judicial buildings. We, we can no longer preach the gospel wherever we want to. Even if you, went to the, if you went to the Supreme Court today and bowed on your knees on the stairway to the Supreme Court today just to pray for this nation, you can be arrested. We've opened the doors to all kinds of, of, of foolishness and perversions and wickedness. Our nation has done exactly the same thing King Saul did. We are standing there thumping our chest and saying, we can do it our way. We don't have to do it God's way anymore. And we have become rebellious. And we need to learn a lesson from what God said to Saul. God said, because you have turned to doing these things I told you not to do, I'm going to do away with you. Does that mean that we're doomed and there's nothing that we can do about it? Yes. It means we're doomed and there's nothing we can do away about it unless we are as a nation willing to get down on our knees before God and repent of our sins. Because God is not going to allow us to continue to thumb our noses at Him and tell Him He has no right to lead this nation according to His plan. We can't do it personally, and we can't do it nationally. And it's time that we as a people, that we the people, remember, we the people in order to form a more perfect, yeah, perfect union. That we the people, in order to get back in right standing with God, make it our business to put God before making money. To put God before getting degrees. To put God before our pleasures. Before making idols out of entertainers of all kinds. That we put God first. That we start filling the churches up with people who are saying, I want to do what God is directing me to do and not what my neighbors are doing. And I want to bring my neighbors in again. When we get to the place where we're willing to repent of the fact that we have been fools in the eyes of God because we've bowed down to everything except Him, 
then God can bless us. Then God will exalt the nation again. And God did when King David took over because King David was a man after God's own heart. And that doesn't mean that he didn't make mistakes. What it means is when he made a mistake, he repented. And that was the difference between King Saul and King David. And it'll be the difference between America 50 years from now or no America 50 years from now. Let's bow our heads. Lord, we have acted foolishly. In many ways, we have emulated the foolish acts of King Saul, of the Israelites when they were rebelling against you. In many ways, Lord God, we have turned aside. We've made gods out of so many things and so many people that we can't even name them anymore. They've just become a way of living. We don't understand that, we, that they are gods, but yet we have bowed down to them. We've given ourselves over to them. And we need God for this nation to come to a place of repentance. And so, Lord, I pray for your church. I pray, Lord God, that you would have the people who call are called by your names to humble themselves and pray and seek your face and turn from their wicked ways. That you would then hear our prayers. And you would heal our land. Lord, we can't be strong without you. We can't, we can't win wars without you. We, we can't even raise our children without you. Lord, we need you. Lord, I pray for moms and dads throughout this land to get off of their backsides and get their children out to Sunday school and church where they're going to learn the, the principles, the, the concepts, the commands that you brought to your people, Lord. Father, we can talk all we want to talk, but if we don't act accordingly, we're losing our nation. For decades now, we've been told by ministers who are dedicated to you that the generations coming up are being lost and we shake our heads and go, oh my God, but we have done nothing to change the trend. And we ask, Lord God, that we would begin to stand up like men, that we would begin to, that we would begin to say, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And then we're going to say, and anybody who wants to come in my house is going to learn about serving the Lord. And we're going to get back together with the congregation of believers so that we can encourage one another and we can learn from one another. God, help us. We need your help, Lord. We have sinned against you, Father. We have sinned against you. And we are reaping the benefits of our sinfulness. Help us. Help us, Lord, because we can't change on our own. We don't know how. Help us, Lord. Bring us back to that place when we first believed in you, Lord God. And we're so determined to serve you. We think that we're wise in our own eyes. We think we know it all. And yet every step we take is one step deeper into the swamp of foolishness. Bring us back, Lord, please. Forgive our sins. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. It's a shame what happened to Saul. It's a shame what happened to, to his son, to his family, to everything that he had. Don't let that same shameful thing happen to us. 
Let's get right. Let's get right. Samuel, in the end, was crying and praying for Saul, saying, God, please, please, please don't destroy him. And God said, quit praying for him. I've determined what I'm going to do. Just quit praying for him. He's made his bed, let him sleep in it. He's determined to rebel against me. Fine. He's going to reap what he sows. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that's what he's going to reap. If he reaps to the, or sows to the flesh, he's going to reap destruction. But if he sows to the Spirit, he'll reap eternal life. That's a rule. Let us change the way we think and act. And now may God bless you and keep you, and may He lift you up and strengthen you, and may you find a deeper sweeter relationship with Him than you've ever known. God bless. Bye-bye.